And if you believe Wikipedia or the news and press, I'm a hacker. Now you're probably thinking, as was already told in the introduction, uh, about people like Anonymous or the people behind the well-publicized hacks against Sony or people who are after your bank account and personal information. That is true in part, but only in a very small part. It is, actually. <laughs> just to get your attention back. Um, is that the term hacker is actually very old, and it uh, stems from the 1960s of the last decade, and it comes from MIT, and more specifically from the TMRC, the Tech Model Railroad Club. And it was the members of the Tech Model Railroad Club who went later on to found the free software movement. And if you know this guy up there, uh, this is the late Wau Holland, one of the co-founders of Germany's Chaos Computer Club. And when asked what a hacker is, he had a very, very nice and often quoted answer. A hacker is someone who is trying to make toast using a coffee machine. <laughs> so it is actually uh, ingenious people working with what they have and make do uh, to arrive at something very, very unexpected. And those people like to linger. They actually like to socialize. And there are places for that. And they're called hackerspaces. And it's a worldwide phenomenon. And over the last year, hackerspaces have been growing. They have been growing in numbers to over a thousand active hackerspaces to date. And now you're asking, what is a hackerspace? Well, a hackerspace is basically infrastructure. And then people start bringing in toys, measurement equipment, 3D printers, laser cutters, robots, pianos. It, it doesn't even stop at that. But you're probably now thinking, what makes this different from the hobby room in my basement? I've got all this kind of stuff, but there's one thing that sets hackerspaces apart from every hobby room in the country. It's people. By now, there are so many people alone in a hackerspace here in Stuttgart. We've got 180 members spanning ages from 7 to well beyond 60. And it is this, this knowledge that is in one place that makes the real difference here. And we've encountered a very, very interesting process not only at the hackerspace here locally, but also at other hackerspaces. We've dubbed this the creative avalanche. It always starts with an acute interest. You're interested in some very specific thing. You want to get to the ground of it. You want to know how does this piece of equipment work? What does it do? What can I do? And then you start developing a first approach. You try working on it. You try fiddling here, there, and then you get to a point where you get stuck. And now, when you're in your hobby room, in your basement, you're stuck. You have to go do research, have to call up someone. Maybe they're not there. You're stuck. Not at a hackerspace. You share your knowledge. You share where you got up to, where you got stuck. And then people start thinking off in their own. Because there's 10, 20 people around you who think a little different than you. And they have different backgrounds, different knowledge and they like to share their knowledge. And then it comes to knowledge recombination, because everyone has a little bit different idea of how to solve your specific problem. And then it takes off. It takes on a tremendous momentum, and you can't stop it. And this works perfectly at hackerspaces, because we have a few key requirements there. You have, a very, you have to have a very informal environment. It is not a work environment, it is more like free time. Well, it is basically all free time we do. And you have like-minded people, because this cuts down tremendously on communication overhead. If you know the way your peers communicate, 
this eases communication a lot. There has to be no pressure involved, because this is not a deadline, this is not work, this is what you want to do. And there has to be nothing, really nothing, that stops your momentum. If you need a special piece of equipment, it has to be there. Be it an oscilloscope to measure something, a multimeter, a 3D printer, a laser cutter, it has to be there and it has to be available. And all the while, we have a derelict school system. At least that's what some say. We have companies in desperate need for more engineers and there's not enough of them. So they keep rushing students through university in even quicker and higher paces. And that is, of course, not working out. Well, well, what do you do? Let's look a bit closer at the local hackerspace here in Stuttgart. Because I could go on, on and on about what's working, what's not. Um, but I have a few examples. Do you notice something? It's that really tiny speck on the fingertip. This is an SMD resistor. It's a surface-mounted device, and it's in virtually every gadget that you own. It's very, very small components. And we have a workshop at our space, uh, the SMD soldering workshop done by one of our members, and this is what it's all about. At one point, we had a group who's, or we still have this group, who's really into electronics and furthering our means of manufacture. Here is one of the early prototypes or types of electronic components that we built. It's reasonably big components, easy to solder, and, well, you can do that and learn it in one afternoon. Quite simple. And within a year, we ended up at this. This little thing, uh, the chip in the middle down there, is actually as big as your thumbprint. So it is very small. It doesn't even have pins. It has only little pads on the side. And then you're wondering, why do we do this? Of course, because it blinks. Because if you turn it around, it does this nice wobbling effect here. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah, this is what it's all about. It has to make sound or blink. <laughs> and then something interesting happened. Because people, even our own, who are at the space every day, started saying, well, this is amazing, but I will never be able to build something like that. And this got one of us thinking, and this is Yoki, who did uh, the SMD soldering workshop in the end, and he came up with this, or this here. This is very, very tiny. Um, if you look at the rows of pins on the edge, uh, each of them is roughly two and a half millimeters spaced. So this is about this size. Um, it is a microcontroller platform for experimentation. But it's not about the experimentation that you can do with this in the next step. It's about building this thing. And you see all these tiny, tiny little components that people are so afraid of. And you can learn soldering this within an hour. And I kid you not, we had people at the space who have never held a soldering iron before, and they managed to build this, and it worked in the end. And that leads to a point where people start going all crazy. For instance, like this. You take the biggest soldering iron there is at the space and you solder the smallest component, and it still works. And it is this fearless approach to technology that we so much love at a hackerspace. It is technological self-empowerment at its best. And there's another workshop. This one having a much broader aim. It takes you through the whole process of manufacturing a printed circuit board, putting components on it, and starting it up. So it starts all with a little UV curing of photosensitive boards. You do the etching, you do the population, building all the components on it, and then you fire it all up. So what we actually built there is a little radio transmitter. You can buy them off the shelf, but if you bought them off the shelf, the next thing would have never happened. You're asking, what are you good for? Simple. You plug in your cell phone or MP3 player, tune your car stereo to the right frequency, and you can listen to your favorite music without having a USB plug in your car stereo. And 
as you can see, there's a little coil on it. And this thing is done by hand, and it is very inaccurate. And it is really difficult to tune this to the right frequency. And during experimentation, we noticed that every time we touch this little coil, the car stereo, when tuned to the right frequency, did a nice little popping sound. And we were like, what the heck is this? And we did some more experimentation, and then this creative avalanche thing happened, and people started experimenting. And we ended up with that little business card here, stuck in between two loops of the coil. And when we started shouting at, at it, we heard our own voice in the car stereo. So what we actually built there by accident is a little FM transmitter microphone. <laughs> and, and it goes also far beyond this, because there's also projects at hackerspaces with a far greater scope. One that I'm involved in as well is Hackerspace Global Grid. It's always along the line of think big and don't let others tell you that what you are about to do will fail. Even if it does in the end, you've learned something on the way. So coming back to Hackerspace Global Grid, um, you probably know what this means. There's tons of satellites up there, and they're communicating with Earth on a constant basis. You have your GPS in your cell phone, you have satellite receivers at home to watch television, all that kind of stuff. We wanted to understand what's behind this and how difficult it really is to implement this on your own. And I'm not saying build satellites, I'm saying just listen in on what's happening up there. Um, we had this idea, we thought, well, build something, make it available to other hackerspaces so they can understand as well and share your information. And this went on for a month, and then we teamed up with the Constellation Platform, an academic project based here in Stuttgart, and they had a concrete goal. They wanted to track low-Earth academic satellites right after orbit insertion. We don't know if it works, but we, th we thought, well, at least this is something to work towards. So the basic idea is you have multiple ground stations. They're in perfect sync, as good as they'll get and you receive a beacon signal sent by the low Earth orbit satellite at slightly different times between those stations. And from these slight delays, you can in turn infer where the satellite was when it was sending the signal. So we started off to do some prototyping. And this is one of the first prototypes that we built for our receiver station. It's, it's roughly 10 by 10 centimeters, so it's not really big. A lot of people think, well, ground stations, that's buildings, it's half a shoebox. Then we built our own timing module, and then it started going crazy, because this is an FPGA, a field program, a programmable uh, logic array. And this is really high tech, and it is not that easy to program, but we had no clue. So we just started going at it, and so far it's working out. You can plug it together, and it's a high, highly modular, modularized a project, so if, if one thing fails, we can replace it. And that makes progress a little bit easier. So, now we've seen a couple of things happening at hackerspaces. And there's actually science behind it. And it's old. Uh, this is Etienne Wenger, and together with Sean Leaf, he published his landmark research paper, Communities of Practice, in the early 90s. What he's saying is, well, if you think communities of practice, what is this? Uh, think back to the early ages, when you wanted to become a carpenter. What did you do? You were looking for a carpenter master and asked him if he would take you as an apprentice. And then you would learn inside a group by doing. You were learning from the master and from his other apprentices. And this is very effective when it comes to learning. So sharing information and group learning directly leads to professional and personal development. And then, only in January this year, another great paper, Connected Learning, by Ito Gutierrez and Livingston, was published. And they, though mainly focusing on youth, uh, have found something that, lets you, that can be directly applied to hackerspaces as well. They inferred that if you can link up personal interest, passion, and support by friends and mentors, with academic achievement and career success, your learning, 
your learning results are far better than in a classic top-down teacher-pupil environment. So to recap, what do we have? We have a society in great need of generalists, not specialists, but more and more generalists, people who are devoted to lifelong learning. And we have science and research to show how learning can be effective and can be applied to all this in a way that makes it fun and that you can put your passion into it. And then we have hackerspaces worldwide where the patterns outlined in this research emerge automatically by the, just by the way that these hackerspaces are organizing themselves. So what can you do? You can go up to hackerspaces.org and find your local hackerspace and pay them a visit. There's also simple steps to start your own if there is no hackerspace yet. And it is only together that we can actually rethink, recreate, and reshape our educational future and have our educational future today. Thank you.